Hello, this is David Sloan Wilson for Evolution, This View of Life, the magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, my guest today is Kevin uh, Leyland, who is the author, the um, uh, first author of an important paper that just appeared in Science Magazine titled Cause and Effect in Biology Revisited. Is Mars' principle of ultimate, uh, proximate ultimate dichotomy uh, still useful? So uh, in the first place, so welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much, David. Thanks for inviting me. And let's begin with some background. Uh, what is the proximate ultimate distinction? Uh, who is Ernst Marr? And uh, and um, uh, let's 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 uh, tell the story from the beginning. Okay, so um, our paper uh, looks back on a, an article which was published in the same journal in Science some fifty years ago by Ernst Meyer, who was a uh, uh, Harvard evolutionary biologist and a very prominent evolutionary bi biologist, the architect of the modern synthetic theory of evolution. And uh, Meyer made the point in his article that different biologists think about causation in different ways. What he referred to as, as functional biologists, what we probably think of today as, um, as molecular cellular systems biologists, are interested in questions about how the, the systems that they study function, uh, how questions, and these he thought of were sort of proximate aspects of causation, the immediate mechanical causes of, of the character concerned. Whereas evolutionary biologists, on the other hand, were more interested in what he referred to as ultimate causation. These are explanations written in terms of evolution, written in terms of, of natural selection, which explain or give answers to why questions, why characters have the properties that they do, uh, and, and what the history of those characters is over, over um, evolutionary time. So this is the distinction that, that he coined in his paper. In fact, he wasn't the first person to draw attention to this distinction, but uh, he brought it to prominence. And he, he was concerned that these two kinds of explanations should not be um, juxtaposed as competing alternatives, that they're, they're in, in essence, different kinds of questions. Um, and to have a complete understanding of what causes a particular evolved character, we need both kinds of explanations. Right, and right away I want to get another important paper on the table, and that is the uh, uh, Methods and Aims of Ethology by Nico Turnberg, Tinbergen, and he asked uh, four questions. So could you uh, uh, add the other two questions that Tinbergen uh, added, and uh, we could get that uh, on the table from the beginning? Yeah, so um, this, this is a paper that follows on a couple of years after Ernst Myers, and, uh, and I personally view it as an advanced on Mayer's formulation. Uh, and one reason why I think that's the case is that Mayer, in a way, talks about ultimate causation and uh, wrapped up in that are two separate things. You've got uh, explanations of function, or why the character functions in the way it does, what it's designed to do, if you like, its design features, but also you've got wrapped up in that the evolutionary history of the character. Right. And Tim Bergen separates those two things out. He says we need a separate explanation for the evolutionary history and for, for the function. He also draws attention to the mechanical causation, um, which is equivalent to Mayer's proximate causation, and to development. Right. Uh, and he says we also want to understand the development of the character. So from Tim Bergen's perspective, if we want to understand a character, we need to give com a complete understanding require. Uh, answers to all four of those issues. Right, and you know, I read your paper and uh, I think about these things a lot myself and one thing I notice is complete confusion and disagreement about what people call evolutionary. So uh, I think Marr called the ultimate causation evolutionary, not proximate causation. I believe Tinbergen uh, restricted evolution to the phylogeny component or something. For me, yes. for me, evolution is all four questions. But do you, do you, is it also your assessment that like there's no agreement amongst our own colleagues as to um, the use of terms, even terms such as functional, the fact that Marr used functional for proximate. I think most people use the word functional for ultimate nowadays. So, so it's, it's odd that these could be our central concepts. And there could be such looseness about about what's called evolutionary. Is that your, also your experience? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. So um, 
it is it does seem really peculiar now for us to refer to a molecular cellular biologist as functional biologist uh, we're used to thinking of behavioral ecologists and evolutionary biologists as studying the function of of particular characteristics which which in a sense equates to the design features that we all seek to understand when we take an evolutionary perspective and yes i i, I agree that there are ambiguities with with regard to what we think of when we use the term evolution and there are those who would like to restrict that term to biological evolution that many of us I think were agreed uh, 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 on this point that we're comfortable using the term cultural evolution and talking about uh, um, ideas as, as evolving rather than um, biological entities but then you're, you're, you're looking for a much broader conception of what evolution is so yes we run up against these, these uh, linguistic problems Okay, so uh, what's wrong with the proximate ultimate distinction? That's the main topic of your paper. What's wrong with it? Well, uh, it depends on what you think of the proximate ultimate um, distinction to be. So um, there is this this primary um, facet of the of the of the proximate ultimate causation. We we, we want to make a distinction between uh, an evolutionary kind of a, account, a historical kind of account of cause, and the immediate. Um, proximate causes and, and I, I think that's widely recognized and fairly uncontentious but the issue is that when Bear, when Mayer introduced this and brought it to prominence he if you like brought in with it a certain amount of conceptual baggage there are certain ways of thinking that became associated with it which he presented if you like as following logically from it but in, which, in my view in which um, a view which is shared by my co-authors, we don't really feel is a necessary component of it. And those are things like, um, he made the argument since um, proximate and ultimate uh, causation are essentially addressing different questions, then in essence one doesn't need to know about ontogeny or developmental processes in order to address evolutionary questions. And that's a contentious statement. That's That's a statement that Many uh, developmental biologists and many uh, evolutionary devo developmental biologists would, would take issue with today. Um, so, and, then, and, and then just historically, that did lead to the marginalization of development in evolutionary right. thought, something which, right. something which has only been remedied since the advent of Evo Devo, uh, a term which was coined, I believe, in the, as late as the 1980s or 1990s, just to... Absolutely, but, there, but, but there's a sense in which um, this is not yet a complete remedy and, and there are many, many people on the developmental side of, of evolutionary biology who are not yet satisfied that we have a complete synthesis that gives a full account of the evolutionary picture. Um, for instance, there are, there are those who argue that, that um, neo-Darwinism lacks a, an adequate account of the origin of the variants that are subject to selection and view developmental processes as, as very important in shaping those variants that, that are uh, available for natural selection and imposing biases on which variants will uh, arise uh, and, and therefore as a process that needs to be recognized as playing some role in evolution. But Mayer's separation of um, proximate and ultimate led to a separation of development from evolution and so it is viewed by many Evo Devo advocates as a barrier to this this new synthesis that they seek. Right, so uh, so an important part of your paper is that you call attention to uh, reciprocal processes in evolution, uh, such things as sexual selection, uh, niche construction, whereby um, uh, organisms influence the subsequent evolution of of the of the of the trait, and maybe you could say a little bit about some of these reciprocal processes and and what they uh, what their implications are in terms of the proximate ultimate distinction or Tinbergen's four questions. Yeah, so another kind of corollary that comes in with with Mayer's uh, proximate ultimate distinction is he had a very what you might think of as linear or unidirectional view of the evolutionary process. So the example he used just to make this a little bit more concrete is avian migration. Um, so we can ask well, what causes a bird to migrate at a certain time in the seasons, um, and um, so he he. Have, of course, points out you can give a, a, a approximate explanation in terms of physiological changes inside the bird or 
or changes in, in day length or, or um, t uh, external temperature. These are the proximate causes. But you can also give an explanation in terms of um, the availability of distributions of resource and, and the selective advantages of moving to take advantage of those, uh, which, of course, would be the ultimate explanation. But from Mayer's perspective, the ultimate explanation started in the environment. So um, we could, if we were interested in tracing back causal influences, go further and say, okay, well, if the seasons explain why birds engage in this migratory behavior, what was it that caused the seasons? Well, and we could give some explanation in terms of the, the, the um, axis of the Earth and its, its tilt of 23.5 degrees or whatever it is, which leads to seasonality. But we make that judgment, as Mayer did, that that's not particularly useful or relevant to us as, as, as evolutionary biologists. We can do pretty well by saying... Let's assume, for sake of argument, that evolution causation starts in the environment and it right. molds organisms to, to become selected to, the, to be fit to that, uh, to that particular environmental uh, mold, if you like, that template. And that works pretty well for a case like migration, but there are many cases, such as the, the instance of sexual selection, which you mentioned, or co-evolution, many other uh, features, um, which... The selective landscape is itself a, an evolving entity or is a feature of the world which can be modified through the activities of organisms. And there, if we want to understand the evolutionary history, we need to ask, well, what caused changes in that selection pressure and explore cases in which that selection pressure is itself co-evolving with the, with the change in the organism. And so these are instances that you might think of as reciprocal causation. Well, One, uh, I think sorry. that, um, for, first of all, full, full disclosure, um, I'm a huge fan of the proximate ultimate distinction in Tinbergen's four questions, and so I initially approached your paper with uh, um, trepidation, uh, and uh, uh, I love the paper, by the way, so, uh, but, um, and I'm also, uh, I love the work that you do on, on these reciprocal processes, and I think a lot about that myself. One thing I found myself thinking, however, is that if you take these reciprocal processes, such as the peacock's tail or the earthworm that lives in a physical environment of its own uh, making, uh, there's a sense in which you can still ask the four questions. I could take the peacock's tail or the earthworm, and I could still ask about um, uh, function, mechanism, development, and, and history. And, and for me, it's, it would be an asset if the... If, if the, uh, the, the theme of, of, of reciprocal evolution could be studied without necessarily uh, changing much about the four-question approach. So is it possible that these are kind of orthogonal? That what, the, what, we, what we end up thinking about the four questions can be orthogonal with, with what we think about reciprocity? <laughs> Well, uh, I should say, uh, in our paper, we don't really address Tim Bergen's four questions. Our paper is about uh, Ernst Meyer's ultimate causation. I actually agree with you that, uh, that Tim Bergen's four questions is a very useful formulation. I'm a big fan of it myself, so I don't really have anywhere near as many issues with that as I would have with the, with the proximate ultimate distinction, which I think brings with it that baggage that I referred to earlier. But there are still some, some um, points of concern that one would want to raise. And um, so, so one of the issues that I would have with the proximal ultimate distinctions is it encourages people to think that there are entirely separate kinds of questions related to um, ontogenetic and, and, and phylogenetic processes. And there's little feedback from one to the other. Right. So if you were to regard development as completely irrelevant to evolution, you essentially have the same problem with Tim Bergen's four questions, okay? Um, if, on the other hand, you think of evolution as restricted to biological evolution and, and um, think of um, processes such as learning and, and culture as very much proximate characteristics which are utterly irrelevant to um, evolution, which are irrelevant only to immediate causation, then once again you run into the run into this this kind of mindset, this conceptual barrier that you can't necessarily see that the history of culture could itself be uh, an explanation for the design features that you might be interested in. So, to the extent that the same corollaries associated with Mayer's proximate ultimate uh, causation 
arise with Tim Bergen's four questions, then it's problematic. But that's not that's nothing inherent to Tim Bergen's four questions. Right. So, yeah. so one of the things that uh, I, I hope will come about from our our article is that it encourages people not to treat these kinds of formulations, which have heuristic value, as dogma but rather to think about them uh, a little bit more and think about the, the history of the ideas and where they came from and why they, why they were, were, were brought in, in, into being and, and to apply them in, in, in a more nuanced way. That's right, and I think that that's why I ended up uh, uh, loving the paper, thinking it was a great uh, addition to the literature. And I think the spirit of Tinbergen's Four Questions has always been that these questions can be asked independently to a degree uh, but that they're best asked in conjunction to with each other, and then so that's the spirit of your paper, as I take it. Ex ex exactly, but not just that we answer each one separately, but we look for ways in which each might feed back into the answers to the other. Yeah. Collectively, they give us a complete understanding, but there's integration. Great. Well, I'm very, very pleased to have uh, to have uh, had this interview and to make it available through Evolution: This View of Life, so that uh, uh, listeners everywhere can basically be treated to what I regard as the uh, state of the art of evolutionary uh, thinking. So uh, thank you very much, Kevin. That was great. Thank you, David. It's very kind of you. See you later. Bye-bye.